Philippians chapter 3 was thinking about the new year and thinking about training our minds to be resolved this coming up next year and how Philippians is just a beautiful book for that. It deals with our minds and our commitment and being resolved. Um, and as we had mentioned earlier, just something that, you know, some things that we can commit ourselves to do in 2024 is read the Bible. Uh, use that little track to read the Bible through in the year. Charles Spurgeon once said this, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. A Bible that is falling apart usually does not belong to someone who isn't. We also can pray. We can also be committed to serve this next year. But Philippians is a letter of resolving our minds. It, it all starts with our minds. In chapter 1 of Philippians, there's four chapters. He talks about the single mind, having a purpose-driven mind. And in circumstances, we can have a single mind. He says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Chapter 2, Paul talks about having submissive mind. He gives the Lord Jesus as our example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, how he took upon him the form of a servant. He became obedient. Our Lord Jesus, the, our God, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so we see that there's a submissive mind, a mind of humility. In chapter 3, what we're getting ready to read over is having a spiritual mind, and understanding the things that have happened in the past and what we need to do moving forward. And then finally, in chapter 4, it's talking about having a secure mind, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. In all things, giving thanks. And it didn't say for all things, but in all things. You can only do that knowing that we're secure in Christ, and knowing that this, these days are short, and the days that we'll have with Christ are long, eternal. So he deals with our mind, but as we look next year, there are things that I want us to see that Paul teaches us. First of all, there's forget, commit, and don't quit. Remember those three things we're going to talk about this morning. Forget, commit, and don't quit. Look at chapter 3. Look at verse 13. Or actually look at verse 12 of chapter 3 of Philippians. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which, also, or which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. That's a powerful verse, isn't it? Verse 19. Verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings, Lord, this morning. We humbly come. Oh, you are our God of all things. You've created all things and all things for you. All things consist and exist for you. Father, may we just humbly come to your eternal word. May we ask, Father, and have desire that you change our hearts. You stir our hearts. And, Father, you open our minds. And we'll give you all the praise and glory for your work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first thing we see here is as we press forward, Paul says, 
We need to equip our mind to forget the things of the past. In verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. The idea here is not so much forgetting the past. Don't forget all the ways God has blessed you, all the ways God has equipped you in your life and brought you, and the unique skill set God has given to you to minister to people. Uh, there's experiences in you, you have in your life that not everybody else has in their life. God has, has sculpted you in your life. If you look past and you look at all the things, all the blessings God has put in your life, how wonderful we can look back and we can say, you know what, God has been preparing me for now. What am I to do now? What does, how does God want me to serve him going forward of all the ways that he's prepared me? So we're not forgetting the, the blessings. We're not forgetting those things which have brought, God has brought us to here. The idea is that we forget the things in our past that can paralyze our present. The things that are stopping you from doing a fully committed Christian life today. Something's got your foot on the brake. And is it something in the past? Is there something prohibiting you from the past? And that's the things that we are to forget. Those are the things that we are to, to move aside. Now, we know that sin has a horrible way of doing that, and especially the devil whispering in your ears. You remember what you did. You're worthless. Why would God ever want you to serve him? Do you remember how far you ran? you remember how far you went? And to the, I mean, people were worried about you. People were praying for you. There's no way God's going to use you. But what are we to do? Well, think about this, for example. Paul and David. Think about Paul. Paul had sin, horrible sin, before he was saved. I mean, he pursued the church. Actually, he tells us that in verse 4. Look up at uh, Philippians chapter 3. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh more, or flesh, I more. Look at verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul is bringing up his past here. And we know that when Jesus came to Paul, the road to Damascus, Paul had all this zeal to persecute the Lord's churches. He thought he was doing God a favor. He thought he was doing the service of God. He was doing everything he did in the name of God. And then Jesus came and knocked him on his butt with this bright light and where Paul went blind. And, and, and Paul's like, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus says, it is I, Jesus. Jesus appeared to Paul. And so after that, we see Paul is saved. But Paul stayed in darkness for three days. And could you imagine the guilt of those three days? He, never, he didn't eat. He didn't drink. He didn't sleep. Could you imagine just the weight of that guilt that was on him? All of the past which he had. All of the things. He, he, he would kill God's people. He would cause God's people to blaspheme against God. I mean, this man, he, he was a tyrant to the Christians. And just the guilt he must have felt in that. But what is Paul saying? Leave those things. If the Lord has forgiven you of your past, then we must forgive ourselves and move forward. Move on. Don't let the things of the past, those past sins, hinder your today. Uh, God's not done with you. God's not finished with you. There's a reason you're here. Now look at David. Paul sinned his great sin while he, before salvation. David sinned his great sin while in salvation. David fell hard. He didn't fall away. He fell in grace. What did David do? Well, David committed adultery and then had Uriah murdered. I mean, he completely... I mean, you're talking about the lure of the flesh of the eyes, the flesh... Of the, or the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. I mean, David had this power. That's when opportunity and desire met. David, had, and that's when, sin, that's when sin conceives. When you have the, the lust, but you don't have the opportunity, well, you can sin in your mind. That's what Jesus says. If you look upon a woman 
the wrong way, you've sinned, you've committed adultery. But David, then he had the opportunity. So he cashed in on both of those and then he sinned. He sinned greatly. And then Nathan, as we see, go to David and gave him this allegory about the, the sheep that was stolen. And then there David realized that he had sinned against God against God and God alone. In Psalm 51, we don't have time to turn there, but Psalm 51 is David's cry unto the Lord after he had convicted him of the sin that he committed, horrible, heinous sin, adultery and murder. Uh, David's life wasn't the same after that. I mean, he paid for the consequences, but Nathan said, the Lord has forgiven you. You will not be utterly destroyed. It's Psalm 51. What did David do? He cried unto the Lord, restore my joy. Have tender kindness on me. Have mercy on me. And he went to the Lord to, for the Lord to restore the joy of his salvation. And he said, only thee and only thee have I sinned. Now, even in salvation, we are to forget those things which are behind. You know, when you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, you trust that he has. That sin cannot condemn you. God cannot condemn you. It is God who justifies. Who shall, char who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God who forgives. There's no one greater than God. So when God has forgiven you of your sins, what's that lingering guilt we have? What, what's that prevention that we're... I mean, it's natural, yeah, to feel guilty. But if you allow it to prevent you from moving forward in spiritual joy... It's ultimately unbelief. If you believe God has forgiven you, then that guilt should be gone. It's hard because the law is still doing its job, isn't it? It's still a whistleblower saying, sinner, 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 sinner. Satan's like, I can't believe you did that. I, you, there ain't no way God's going to use you. Look at all the people who saw you do that. But we know that grace is greater than all our sins. God has forgiven you. If God has forgiven you, it's in the past. There's no reason to let it block your future. There's no reason to let it paralyze you. There's no reason for it to not let you take your foot off that break. And let's just go forward. Let's go forward in 2024. So we got to forget the past, first of all. Now, how did Paul do that? Now, here's the help to us. Paul forgot his past because he had realized his reality today. Now look at verse 7, chapter 3. What's our reality? Who are you? Some would say, I, I'm a child of God. I've been born again. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I have a mighty Savior. And it took a mighty Savior to save me. Look at verse 7. Paul, first of all, he had a reality check of what is gain versus loss in your life. But those things were gained to me, those things that were gained to me in my past, those I counted for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Life has a new meaning for Paul. It wasn't about the things that he used to do in the past. It's about what he's going to do now and about what he's going to do stepping forward. And so we see the reality sets in that Paul says, you know, the things that I used to evaluate and elevate in my life as great gain in the face of Christ, in the face of eternity, those things are lost. Oh, but Christ is great gain. Christ, now that's the reality. Child of God, he's talking to saved people. Now look at verse 9. He also had the reality of our, our status. He says, being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the law, or through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's how you get to heaven, verse 9 right there. That's how you do it. It's not by what we have done. It's by what Jesus has done. And he has fulfilled the law perfectly that I could not fulfill the law. Even if I started today, I would still be under the law. It takes a death 
The only way to come out from under the law and be saved and be right before God is to be out from under the law. And the only way to do that is for that law to have been satisfied. The law has already been paid. The transaction's already been made. He's a, it's like a prepaid visa, right? Christ paid for all my sins, past, present, future. This is the reality of my status today. Realize the reality of your status. Not just what's gain and loss, but who are you? I'm saved. I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. If I were to die today, there's not one less. There's not one more confession I need to do. There's not, I've got to get right here. I've got to do this. I've got to get right here. No, I'm saved. I've been justified freely by his grace because it's God's gospel. You know, the, the attention of the work is not on my faith. The attention of the work is on how God saved a poor sinner like me. God came down and saved me, and now I'm a royal. I'm in the royal family. I don't, I don't know why. I didn't deserve it because it wasn't found in me by his own goodness and his own grace. He saved you. Well, that's your reality of status. Well, look at verse 10. Another way that he could forget the past is he had to realize his purpose was new. His purpose, in verse 10, that I may know him. What was Paul's ultimate purpose in life? What was his main ambition? He had given up his entire past, all his ambition, all the college course credit, everything. <laughs> all towards his old career. What was Paul's passion? That I may know him. That I may know Jesus. That I may know my Savior. That I may know him. There's so much to know about him. There's so much. Paul's grasping to know more. Those were Paul's two ultimate purposes, was to know him and to follow him. Whether that was through persecution, crucifixion, whatever, because Paul knew that he'd also follow him through the resurrection, that Jesus had the victory. The world thought they had the victory over Jesus, but Jesus had the victory. And that's our new perspective. That's our reality is rather, I want to know him, and I want to be, I don't want to follow him. That's what he said, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Jesus. So we forget the past. The way that you do that is you keep your eyes up and ahead. Our mind, our eyes should be up and ahead, not behind us and down. Not dwelling on the past and discouragement, but looking ahead in hope and encouragement. Knowing Christ has paid for your sins and those things in the past. One, how, some way God may use your past, but let's not let it hinder our future. The second thing we see in verses 13 through 16 is not only that we forget those things which are behind, but we commit. There's three ways he shows us to commit. We commit with our eyes ahead, our feet ahead, and our confidence. So Receiving the faith is what it says here in verse 13. Brethren, I count on myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now that reaching forth in the Greek, it is to stretch out in a continual reach. You just keep stretching for it. It's a full stretch, always reaching you're always reaching for perfection of knowledge, holiness, and happiness. You are always stretching for knowledge, holiness, and happiness with a desire for that. Now, the metaphor we know that Paul brings up is running a race. And as we run the race, we know that we're not to look behind us in discouragement. You know what? I fell back there, but... You know, and just be discouraged, but you keep your eyes ahead when you're running a race. And you don't look around. 
when you're running a race and become discouraged or filled with pride in comparison to the people around you. Uh, now, we need to be aware. We're going to talk that a little, bit, a little bit more because there are people who want to snatch your joy, snatch your spiritual life, and derail you. You want to be aware that there's no wolves in sheep's clothing or kind of like the Bodville villains. They're just trying to hit you and run you off your race or off your course. But it says here that we're always reaching, never having apprehended. The reality is, is we're always reaching. And we'll never apprehend until the Lord takes us home into glory. But our desire should be perfect knowledge, perfect holiness, and perfect uh, happiness in this Christian life. Um, so we are not looking forward to, to those things. And Colossians 3, 1, there's, Philippians and Colossians are very similar to living this Christian life. But in Colossians 3, 1, you don't have to turn there. He says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. And the next thing he says in verse 14 is not only are we reaching, but we're pressing. So our eyes are ahead when we're reaching, and when we press forward, we press toward the mark of the, high, the, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is our action. This is our movement. This is our feet ahead. Our eyes are ahead. Now let's bring our feet ahead. Let's actually press forward. Uh, in the Greek, that pressing forward means to run swiftly in order to catch, to pursue. And which is interesting because he, I think he's using it in an ironic way considering he just talked about his past and how he used to pursue. He used to run uh, the wrong direction. He was running after God. He was running after God's people. He was running in ignorance. He was running in error. But now he says in this race, God has taken me, picked me up, put me on solid ground, and told me to run this way now. And so now that's the pursuit. That's us pressing toward, not giving up. We press forward to that mark. Uh, for the rest of Paul's life, he was passionate about the pursuit of that singular ambition to know Christ, to follow him. To know him and to follow him. A step forward towards Christ is going to be a step away from the sin that entangles you. You know, how many times, uh, you know, you've all been wrapped up and you can't get loose, whether it's a dog collar, whether it's fishing line, whether, whether it is and you're just tangled up, you can't get loose. A step towards Christ is a step away from that entanglement of sin in your life. Also, a step towards Christ in believing is a step away from self-doubting. Well, I'm just going to fail. I'm just going to fail, and then I'm going to get discouraged, and then I'm going to hate it. How many times do we have that? And honestly, I believe that's Satan whispering to you. Because you're forfeiting your best life. The Word of God makes it clear that God created us for a purpose. And you're never going to be happy until you are fulfilling the design which with you were made. You were made to worship God. God made you to worship Him. And the, the problem is, is things got off the rails and now you're worshiping other things besides God. And so you still have the worship ticker in you. You're wanting to worship something. It's got to be something. But you will not be the happiest that you will ever will be until you are fulfilling the design that God created you. And that is to worship Him, to love Him, to fellowship with Him, to seek Him, to desire Him, to press forward. Paul said that life that I had, he thought it was something, but it was nothing. It's dung compared to knowing Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Knowing Him. Well, you know, I heard, I don't know if it was a comedian or what, or what, and as we ramp up our desire to read the Bible next year, I mean, you don't need to use that plan, or you don't even have to read it. You can just listen to it on, on audio tape. You know, he had said, can you imagine going to heaven and meeting up with Obadiah and Haggai, and you've not read, read their books? Uh Hey, Obadiah. Uh, and Obadiah is going to be like, hey, have, have you read my book? I'm like, oh, I don't know if I've read, read your book. I've, I've read Timothy a lot and I've read Paul a lot. 
Now, what about Jesus? Can we know more about Jesus? You better believe we can know more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. And so let us commit our hearts. Let us commit our minds. If, let's start there. Start at the Word of God. That's the place to start. And then, you know, as, as we look to 2024, let's ask God to keep us faithful in church. And every blessing comes from first faithful attendance in church. Ask anybody who's been faithfully attending in church, and they're going to say, I never received this blessing over here until I got this one right. I was never called to preach until I started faithfully attending church. I was never happy in the will of God or even sought the will of God until I was faithfully attending in church. And every um, consequent blessing comes from that blessing. And so let's ask the Lord. I mean, we were in the flesh. People are going to miss. People can't come. There's shut-ins. There's people who work. There's people who cannot make it. But if we can, if we can, let's, let's come. And then, uh, so that's another way this next year that we commit ourselves. But pressing towards the mark is feet ahead. It's a feet ahead. The last one is confidence. Um, and he says, and we're not going to get to go all over that in verse uh, 15. Let us therefore be as, be, I'm sorry, there, let us therefore as many as be perfect, that means mature, Remember, we're talking about the spiritual mind in this chapter. Be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Let's keep our mind perpetually the way that Paul is telling us to prepare it here. Reaching forth. Keep our eyes ahead, not behind. Reaching forth. Knowing when you ask God to forgive you of your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is, it's God who justifies. It's God who forgives you. And know that he has forgiven you. And take off the weight that was impeding you. Take your foot off the brake and go forward. And if you are otherwise minded, God will show it to you. And that's what that means. In verse 16 through 20, he goes on to talk about corporately. Now, he's talking to us how to turn our lives around individually here, but then he goes on to the church. He goes on to talk about now that you've got your private life uh, good and, and you're committed, let's work on our church life. Let's work on our uh, professional or our, our public life. But let me skip that and go to the end. The last point is don't quit. Don't quit. Verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto the glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If we fall. All right. We've committed ourselves. Our eyes are ahead. Our feet are ahead. We're moving in confidence. We're pressing forward. We're stretching like, like an athlete, like a racer is stretching forward. And when we fall, it's not a matter if we fall. We will fall. We will run into discouragement. We will run into sin. But don't quit. We ask God to forgive us and trust that he has and help us to stand back up by his grace. To give us the strength, the courage to stand back up and get right back in the race and keep moving forward, keep moving forward. And so we don't quit because here's the thing. Paul calls this out to us. I know that we are going to fail. How do I know that? Because in verse 21, what kind of body do we have right now? We have a vile body, a body that has temptations and lusts, a body that wants to sin, that serves self, a body that wants to wander. It has, a, Paul calls it our body of death. Who shall redeem me from this body of death? Paul calls it our mortal body. The body you have right now is not going to live forever. It can't live forever because corruption cannot inherit incorruption. We're going to receive a new body. But while we are in this body, it wants to sin against God. And that is the spiritual warfare, which we have in the Word of God. It starts with our mind. It starts with our attitudes. It starts with our goals. What was Paul's goals again? To know Christ. To know Him more perfectly. 
to, to know Christ and the happiness of his will. That was Paul's goal. That was his spiritual mind. You know, though we're weary, look at this. What an encouragement and upliftment because we're going to get tired of this fight. Paul was tired of the fight. He was exhausted. That which I want to do, I, I do not do. And that what I don't want to do, that I do. It was frustrating. Especially for someone who just loved the Lord and wanted to please him. Verse 21, but look at this. There's an encouragement here. Your race is almost over. It's almost over. That it may be fashioned. This vile body may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It is never too late to get in the race. It is never too late to turn, ask the Lord to forgive you, restore my joy just like David did, Restore my joy, set my feet, and start that run. You are still here. You can still run. And that's what, how do we run? Eyes ahead, feet ahead, not looking behind, not judging others, not basing our progress off others, but looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is the blessing. Don't quit. Don't quit. If you get knocked down, ask for repentance. Trust that God has forgiven you of your sins and ask him to restore you of your joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for loving us and being forbearing. Father, your long suffering is amazing and it's, it's just, it's beyond our comprehension that you love us this much. Father, we, we do pray for each one here and their heart and their need and their life. Lord, you know each one. Father, we pray that you would work your power. It's not by man's wisdom, man's persuasion, but it's by the power of your word and the effectual working that you do in their hearts by your power. Father, we must decrease. You must increase. Father, may we see your glory. May we leave this place worshiping you even more. And we love you. And thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.